Good afternoon, and welcome to End of Life Care, from one set of caring arms to another. For this unique event, we have assembled a panel of experts to share important insights into how hospice professionals, funeral directors, members of the clergy, and grief counselors can come together to support those at the end of life. Joining me are, far right, Dr. Robert Friedman, the Chief Medical Officer at Hospice Austin, right here in Austin, Texas. Dr. Thomas Long, the Bandy Professor of Preaching at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Thomas Lynch, an award-winning author and poet and funeral director from Milford, Michigan. And Dr. Alan Wolfelt, an author, educator, and grief counselor, and he's the founder and director of the Center of Loss and Life Transition in Fort Collins, <clears throat> Colorado. All right, let's get started. To begin the program, what I'd like to do is to give, give each one of you the opportunity to speak from your perspective on the importance of not only working together, but working together to best help families as they prepare for the death of a loved one. And I'd like to start with Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Ed. So just by way of background, um, I'm involved in, in providing actual clinical care uh, for people who are um, near the end of their lives, and I'm involved in administration and education, so I appreciate being here today. Thank you. And uh, also by way of background, uh, just to kind of frame things from a hospice perspective, uh, for people who don't know or aren't fully aware, hospice uh, is involved in providing um, care to people who are terminally ill or approaching the end of their lives, uh, by definition, within the last six months uh, of, of their lives. And hospice uh, is a team effort. It involves, uh, number one on the team is the person who actually has the life-limiting illness, and then their uh, family and caregivers. And then the hospice team consists of uh, a case manager who coordinates everything, a nurse, and uh, a hospice physician, a home health aide, uh, uh, social worker, chaplain, there are volunteers, there are a lot of services provided, and uh, there are bereavement services provided, uh, which really uh, meshes well with what, we, what we'll be discussing today, uh, I'm sure. And there are a lot of other uh, services provided that aren't necessarily directly embedded within the hospice, such as obtaining medical equipment and medications, um, but along those lines, that that also focuses on today in that hospices, it behooves all hospices to be involved in working with other uh, professionals and the rest of the community in terms of providing uh, the, uh, the care and the support that uh, people and their loved ones, their families need as they approach, as someone approaches the end of uh, his or her life. And so hospice really uh, functions along the lines of what we call, uh, and probably the key phrase would be goals of care. So that uh, it's, it's, it may sound like a new catchphrase to some people. You may not have heard it before, actually. But uh, goals of care has been around for a bit. It's, it's catching on more in, in medicine in general. And it's not about what my goal of care is uh, for you, for example, um, or about uh, what I think uh, someone should be doing or what kind of care they should be receiving. Uh, it's all about the person who has the uh, life-limiting illness or disease, what his or her goals of care are. And what hospice does is does its best to support those goals of care so that that person and their loved ones and uh, family members can, and caregivers can actually achieve those goals of care. So it's all about a team approach. And that also, that team approach involves uh, being involved with people like you, actually, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, bereavement counseling, in terms of uh, uh, funeral preparations, and so hospices, um, are, as a result, are involved in, in, in helping to coordinate or help to maybe more importantly educate uh, uh, people um, about choices so that they actually can be, um, and I could, probably the best word to be a consumer really, uh, in terms of making what would be the best choice for them. But a, a hospice should never really be telling someone what to do or where to go for care. And so um, that probably kind of in, in a nutshell would cover what um, a hospice should be involved in, in care while a person is alive and even after they are deceased um, in terms of helping the families and, um, and loved ones and caregivers um, get through the time thereafter. 
Yes, Dr. Long. Yes, I'm Tom Long, and um, I'm a theologian on the faculty of a Methodist Theological School at Emory University in Atlanta. I'm also a Presbyterian minister. I've had a, a long-term interest in uh, how pastors can become involved in end-of-life care, especially in funeral planning and uh, the service to families at the time of death. I think what um, I'm, I'm envious of the collaborative approach that you describe in your uh, hospice, because I think that's kind of a model for uh, how it ought to be for an even wider team. And I think that the reason why we need a, a, a broad team approach to collaboration um, comes because there's a kind of an irony about the end of life. It, it, it involves a, a basic uh, human simplicity combined with a profound human complexity. Uh, the simplicity of it, it seems to me, is that we all go through this passageway. This is a, this is an experience that every human being has, and the, the path in the forest has been marked by generations uh, before us. Uh, uh, so common is the experience that in the in the medieval church there was a body of uh, devotional literature called Ars Moriendi, uh, which means the art of dying well. Um, in which uh, people actually dress rehearsed for their own death. Um, so predictable were the anxieties, so predictable were the feelings and thoughts uh, faced at the time of death that people could, in the prime of life, prepare for it by rehearsing these experiences that they have. Um, I think today, though, we're pr profoundly aware of the complex side of it, that um, uh, even though we all die and we all move through that passageway, we do we do it in our own ways. And there are great differences in terms of our physical experience of death, our existential experience of death, our relational experience of death, our theological experience of death. Uh, some people go surrounded by the love of family, and others, the end of life is a time when the fractures and fissures in their relationships are experienced. Um, some people go with a kind of confident faith. Others go with rage or fear or asking deep theological questions, why me? And there isn't any one caregiver who has a panoramic assessment of all of these multiple levels and complexities. And so uh, the funeral director, the hospice uh, physician, the experienced caregiver, the pastor, we all have our angles of vision on this. And at one level, you could talk about our care being complementary, but I think the collaborative model is really what we, what we need here, a kind of conversation among the various perspectives that see different things happening at different levels as people move through this profound passageway of death. So, your, your team approach at the hospice is one, I think, that ought to spread into an even uh, wider team. Thanks, Dr. Long. Um, my name's Tom Lynch, and I'm a funeral director from Milford, Michigan, where I've um, um, operated a funeral home since uh, 1974. And um, I, I guess, like a lot of funeral directors, my interest in... Uh, death and dying and grief and bereavement w began as a sort of uh, part-time job that my father gave me so that we could make, you know, car payments and go out on dates and uh, imagine the movies and football games and things like that. But what happens to, and I've seen this happen in the funeral home since, to young people who come to work with us is that they might be 16 or 17 or 18 and swinging the door at the funeral home at night. Their job is to get the flowers uh, in the right room and to keep the coffee pots cleaned and to um, be sure that people who come to the door are greeted and given good orderly direction. And at some point in this, um, some widowed person or some newly orphaned child will be leaving the building and take them by the shoulders and look at them in the eye and say something like, I couldn't have done this without you. And for me and for the young person that will have this happen to them uh, in the weeks and months to come, the sense that you are somehow capable and helpful and, and useful uh, to people at this difficult uh, uh, 
time in their family history is immediately um, overwhelming. And you begin to think, maybe I could do this thing. And um, and for better or for worse, I, I, though I'd have to say for better, of my uh, eight siblings, all but two ended up working uh, either as funeral directors or in uh, support of our work as funeral directors in southeastern lower Michigan. And when you said, Ed, that we've assembled this panel of experts, I just never felt like an expert at this because, do you know, the real experts in end of life aren't talking, as we say. And uh, uh, so I just feel like we're all sort of fellow pilgrims trying to find um, religiously our way home, um, maybe psychologically some kind of safe harbor, Medically, we're trying to find some good, useful information for what comes next, the stepping stones between where we are now and where we know we're going. So um, I think what I've learned, I know uh, over the 40 years I've been doing this, I've met with so many families who come to our funeral home already so grateful for the local heroics of their pastors and priests and rabbis and imams and the people they met through hospices outreach to them and the medical people in intensive care wards and emergency rooms and first responders uh, out on the road or in places where terrible things happen. And I just think um, the best we can do, the best I can do anyway, is sort of try to meet them where they are and see if there's anything I can do to show up, pitch in, do my part, and then assume that they're going to be going to people of goodwill. The rule that I follow is that the job of a funeral director is to serve the living by caring for the dead. I stole that from Howard Rather, who probably stole it from someone else. I mean, I think it was I think it was Eliot who said all poets borrow great poets steal. I stole that out, outright, but I, I do know that uh, I was reading a biography of the great Irish poet Yeats and at some point he wrote in a letter to Ezra Pound that the only subject that should be of interest to the studious mind is sex and death. I think I was 18 or 19 when I read that, and I thought, how very handy for me, because I, I approved of sex, and I was surrounded by the dead, and I thought, um, this will be a resource and teaching tool for me. I'll learn life by dealing with people at this at this time in their life, and and... I've, I have not been disappointed. I've learned more from the dying and the bereaved and the people who um, deal with them than anything else. So I'm grateful for that and grateful for this uh, collaboration. And thank you, Tom. Alan? Yeah, thank you. I'm Alan Wolfelt, and I'm, I'm just so uh, honored to be a part of this uh, panel uh, who are exploring the mystery. I like what you said about experts. Mystery, something to be pondered not explained, and we're here talking about death, end-of-life care. Whether it's a hospice or a funeral home, I guess I've been invited to be a part of this because I'm so passionate about the reality that our responsibilities don't end at the time of death or at the end at the time of the funeral. Bereavement means to be torn apart, to have very special needs. And to have the opportunity of a forum where I can talk about what some of those special needs are and how we need to work collaboratively together, be it in a funeral home or hospice care, to best serve the families that we're all so honored to serve, it's a privilege. As many of uh, the listeners out there know, we live in a fairly mourning avoidant culture these days. We give people three days off work or school. It better be a biological nuclear family relative on your genogram. And then we tend to tie it to helping goals like, are you over it? Have you let go? Or have you had closure? I always say if you buy a house, you have a closing. But when somebody precious that you opened your heart to You've given love to and received love from. That's nothing we close on. We open to the presence of our loss. And I'm sad to sit here and reflect on how a European author just said, the first thing you need to know about North Americans is we think death is optional. In many ways, we're trying to go around it instead of through it. But Helen Keller was right. The only way to the other side is through. So anything I can do to help advocate that for bereaved people, to have ongoing support, not tied to some linear model due to some Medicare, Medicaid guideline that really perpetuates a misconception that grief is somehow linear, 
that it's an end point. I always say mourning never discreetly ends. Only as time goes on, it may erupt less frequently. Hopefully we'll have grief bursts the rest of our life. So thank goodness that there's a mandate in hospice care to continue to follow families long after the death. Thank God that we have people in funeral service who also provide aftercare and know their responsibility does not end at the grave. And so thank you for letting me be a part of this and to share my excitement for how important it is to create places of sanctuary where people can disengage from their normal demands and give attention to the need to mourn well in a culture that's not doing that real well. Blessed are those who mourn. Thank goodness we have folks coming together today who are advocates, not only for the dying person, but you know, somebody said, there's always two parties to a death, the person who dies and those who are bereaved. Privileged to be a part of this group. If, if I could circle back, um, because I, you've all, all three of you have touched upon something that I, I believe is extremely important, and actually more than touched upon it, because you're so passionate uh, uh, about how you feel and, and what you do. And that um, in this country, and, and it's, it's funny that you mentioned uh, North America, because in the United States of America, uh, the, quite honestly, the medical industry over decades really took uh, dying and death away from people. It took it out of the home. It promoted an idea that potentially people could live forever. And there are those factions within the medical industry who still actually believe in research towards that. Um, and it, it really helped associate families and people who were dying from actual the, the, the dying and death experience. Um, and, and honestly, uh, in hindsight, a great disservice to our society. Um, it, it breaks down culture when you do that, um, dissociating children from um, uh, being, being part of the complete circle of life in, in witnessing um, dying and death, for example. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons that I, I was drawn into hospice and palliative medicine, palliative medicine actually taking care of people with life-limiting illnesses who aren't ready for hospice. Uh, but I was drawn into that because I feel that, that that needs to be restored, and I know that uh, all of those of us in, in medicine who are involved with um, hospice and palliative care promote and, in fact, preach that. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons I mean, we recognize that the, uh, more than 90 percent, probably something like 97 percent of the people in this country would prefer to die at home. And that's not the case quite often. Um, and uh, recognizing when, when medication or procedures um, really um, where the risks far outweigh the benefits or there's, or there's nothing to be gained from that. And, and, and the idea of, of educating people so that you don't end up promoting that because it's your agenda as a physician, but educating people so that they can make the best decisions for themselves uh, being so important. I'll be perfectly honest with you, uh, and I, I probably don't speak for myself when I say that, Doing things such as prescribing medications or assessing people physically, uh, I, I won't, I won't denigrate that by saying it's just second nature, but it comes, it does come easy after all these decades of helping to take care of people and taking care of people as individuals, not as something out of a cookbook or a recipe, uh, which is the beauty of being able to go into people's homes to help take care of them. Uh, but, Getting involved with uh, people who have life-limiting um, illnesses or diseases and their, their loved ones and caregivers um, in helping to explore um, the emotional, the spiritual, and the psychosocial aspect of what they're going through um, is, is, to me, uh, that much more fulfilling and rewarding in terms of being able to perhaps help people um, navigate through that time of their lives. I was glad that you brought up the word closure. Um, I, I have come to view that as not a particularly good word uh, for end of life care. I, you know, when we say we're, we're seeking closure, closure for whom? Um, are we seeking closure for the deceased? All the great faith traditions really talk about this mystery that lies beyond in an open ended kind of way. It's not as if it's closed down, it's opened up. Or sometimes we mean closure for the bereaved. But uh, there's a kind of a duty-bound thing about that, a, mor a moral obligation to finish it off and finish it off quickly. Whereas, uh, you know, with a profound, loving relationship, uh, you don't ever heal over entirely. You're always uh, 
remembering that and honoring it and feeling the pain of its uh, of its loss. And closure is really not a good goal, I don't think, for us. I think to counter that in a society that has overused and misunderstood it, other cultures don't even use that semantic. I have a little ritual of reception that, that I try to mentor people to consider creating one of their own. The one that works for me is no rewards for speed, not attached to outcome, divine momentum. So before that, I have the honor of, of trying to create a place of hospitality. You know, Henry Nouwen defined it as shared space where a stranger can become a friend. To create that hospitable space for somebody who's been torn apart, to me, we have to work to counter at a societal level all these interjects going on that our job is to get somebody to have a good death or to have closure. So well, I'm not sure what might work for others, but for me to counter it, it, it which you make me think about as you, as you explore the inappropriate use of closure as a helping goal, is no rewards for speed, because there should be no rewards for speed. We're, we're, you know, Not attached to outcome, because the more attached you are to outcome, the more pressure there is for me to be the doctor and you to be the patient and me to get you to let go, when, of course, your instinct, searching and yearning, is to hold on, right? And divine momentum, because I'm never sure exactly what helps, which interfaces a lot with the mystery. I'm not, I'm not always sure what helps, but I know that if I create hospitality combined with sanctuary and I and I try my best, knowing I'll never arrive, to companion somebody as opposed to treat them. You know, treat comes from the Latin root word tracture. It means to drag. That's the last thing a bereaved person needs is to be dragged. Patient, passive, long-term sufferer. So if we treat patients, we drag passive, long-term sufferers. That's the last thing a fellow human being needs. They need a safer, safe place to continue to dose themselves on this new narrative that has to be created in the face of the loss. To your, um, to your um, notions about um, sanctuary and um, welcome and permission and hospitality, I would like to add the one um, of work, of labor, of tasking, uh, what I think Jeffrey Gore called grief work. And it seems to be a work he had in mind that had less to do with the brain and more to do with the large muscles. Mm -hmm. And you use the word track very nicely. Uh, uh, William Carlos Williams, a pediatrician from Rutherford, New Jersey, dead with years now, wrote a poem called uh, Tract, in which he endeavored to, as he said, I will teach you my townspeople how to do a funeral. You have the ground sense necessary. So it's true, we oughtn't to drag the bereaved hither and yon between stations of healing. But they may have to drag their dead to some place where they commit them to the fire or the sea or the tomb or the grave. And they might have to do that hefting and lifting and moving and going themselves. I, I, I say this in, in some ways speaking out of my own experience. Uh, when my mother died at 65, my sisters, God bless them, kept vigil with her upstairs as she was dying of a cancer that took away her voice and her freedoms and uh, eventually her being and her beauty. Uh, my father and my brothers and I, uh, each of us funeral directors, were out in the garage discussing what we could do about that. Uh, mostly it came around to what casket we'd use. And as silly as that was, it was the only authentic sense of control we had in what was otherwise a helpless situation. And I envied my sisters, I must tell you this, the calm that they had after my mother died. It's not as if they didn't grieve. It's just that they did with such a deep sense of self-possession and the sense that things happen as they are supposed to happen. Whereas the brothers and our poor dear father and I were wandering around trying to figure out what we could do about it. What we could do about it was much the same as when my father died. My brother Pat and I got in a, on a plane and flew down to Florida where his body was and prepared him to be brought home to the rest of our siblings. And I think that labor, that work, however difficult it was, uh, brought us home with sort of a head start. There was kind of a, 
a, a brilliance about the old Victorian sense of a year of mourning, mm -hmm. by which they meant that you could be crazier than a hoot owl for a year, and after that, uh, you'd need some professional help. But for a year, you could laugh at the wrong time, weep at the wrong time, um, you could be disconsolate, and no one would trouble you from it because there was not a sense that you had to pass through this stage or that stage or accomplish some emotional goal. Um, and now we've reversed, as you know, yeah. who does well and who doesn't. If you openly mourn, yeah. someone says, oh, he's overly emotional. My, my mother died three years ago yesterday, and I was reflecting I all day yesterday day, yeah. uh, when I was at her funeral, and I'm up at her precious body, her body that animated life, what I call in writing the ultimate death symbol that we used to always know you said hello to ever in any way think you'd get to goodbye. Mm -hmm. Now we've kind of reversed it, you know. And I'm up there and it's doing just what it's supposed to do. It's taking my grief from the inside. It's touching me in a way that I'm, whether I wanted to or not, I'm mourning, mourning the shared response to loss. And I hear this lady over to the side of the room go, well, that's Dr. Wolfelt, her son. He's, he's written many books on grief, but he's not holding up very well. <laughs> Which, in fact, was, I was doing just what I was supposed yeah. to do. And as yeah. you said, we used to have that time. You'd have morning clothes on until the late 1960s, 70s. Strangers would approach you. Who died? We called it melancholia. We didn't give you a grief adjustment disorder 15 days later. And we never used words like let go or closure. But now that's what we're faced with, aren't we, in some ways? Well, it's the, it's the idea that, that someone would tell someone else that you're going to get over this, um, or I understand what you're going through, uh, because we don't. We don't understand, none of us understands exactly what anyone else is going through, even if we've lived through similar situations. Um, and people, as, as, as you've already mentioned, people don't get over uh, the loss of a loved one. Um, they, they, and they don't move on either. It's part of their life experience, and and their life their life does go on. Uh, but it's not that they ever get get over it or leave it behind. Woven and into the fabric. It's it's gone. Like I finished little league, um, you know, when I was ten years old. That's that's gone. Doesn't matter anymore. Transformation, yeah. entire change in form. Not a getting back to to an old normal. That's right. our problem when we apply traditional mental health concepts to grief care. You know, if you go back and look at the roots of the model of homeostasis that I was taught in Psych 100, the professor drew the bell curve, said this is the model of homeostasis. Things come along in life, they knock you out of balance, and we teach caregivers like myself. I was taught to intervene, which means to come between in an effort to reestablish the prior state of homeostasis. Now, there's only one major flaw in that theory. It doesn't work. I've never met a person who's had a precious child die, a spouse die, a friend die, who's the same after it than before. Mm -hmm. And yet we continue to use helping goals tied to resolution. And are you done? We're not done. Morning never discreetly ends. But we're a culture that's big on control. Yeah. We don't even do holidays when they occur. We put them on Mondays or Fridays so we can have three-day weekends. Tom Lynch, I want to ask you uh, about something else that you've said. You talk about the, the labor um, that is involved in addressing uh, end-of-life uh, issues. I, and I, I want to get your view as a funeral director. I, a lot of times we ask people to do a lot of pre-planning mm. of their funeral. And one of the things that people who are doing this will sometimes say is, I, you know, I don't want to be a burden on my family. Mm. I had a theologian who wrote an article basically with the title, I want to be a burden mm. on my family, yeah. that there is a kind of holy labor mm that is involved in the doing the shovel work, the muscle work of, of death. You, you plan with a lot of families. What's your thought about what, what's appropriate to plan, what's not appropriate to, to plan? Well, I think anybody who has a job to do, um, it's, um, it's good duty for them so, so far as it surrounds the death in the family. Um, you were saying earlier today about um, former cultures knowing who would do the cooking, who would do the grave digging, who would do... And one of the great blessings of my life is that I've spent a good deal of the past 50 years back and forth between here and a rural community on the west coast of Ireland where they don't have someone to call. Um, you know, they don't have a, a backhoe to... The, the neighbors dig the grave, so... And the women lay out the dead in the bed, and... 
The undertaker eventually comes and takes the body into town so that they can avail of the better parking in the nearness of pubs for some reason. <laughs> but, um, but then they process the dead out to church uh, from the uh, funeral parlor and then walk most often, uh, shoulder the body yeah. from the door of the church or from the foot of the altar actually uh, to the graveyard. Teams of pallbearers filling in for each other. So uh, the boys, now old men you played football with, will carry you from here to the corner. And the people with whom you sang in the choir will carry you from the corner to the bridge. And then from the bridge to the next intersection, maybe your sons and daughters will help. And then from there to the graveyard, um, uh, another group of uh, neighbors, maybe the local farmers with whom you did business. So everybody has a job to do. And I've been, because of my long association with that place, part of the crew that has to open the graves. And in Ireland, as in many parts of Western Europe, graves are used over and over again so that to prepare a grave for a new death, for a new burial, you are disturbing the grave of maybe a generation or two or three of that person's uh, ancients. And to collect the, I mean, this is Shakespearean, to hold the femurs and skulls of uh, a neighbor's parents and grandparents and put them carefully into it turns out to be a fertilizer bag, and then wrap them carefully in a subgrave so that the next morning after Mass, the newly dead can be placed literally on the foundation of the old dead. Um, it's amazing. People end up being so bone-tired with the shovel and the shoulder work and the movement from one station to the other. Um, almost no one... Um, seems to, and, I, and of course, then they have to talk to each other a lot. So they call into the bereaved. Although they just call in because they call it paying court, C U I R T, an old word for meaning do not leave them alone. Come and hear their story. But they've already said, you know, I think sometimes we, we declared some years ago a jihad, I think, on what we call cookie cutter funerals. And yet, to me, um, what I see as having real power in such places is the cookie-cutter funeral, the certain knowledge that what will be said over this corpse will be said over another one tomorrow and was said over another one two months ago. And that once you submit your story, which is unique, to the larger story, which is mighty and powerful and commonly held among the whole community, the... the uh, the medicine in that is overwhelming. The sense that you are almost healed before you've left the graveside. I think there's also medicine in having something almost physical to do around the occasion of death. And we're probably not going to go back in this country to a time when we dug our own right. graves and so on. Uh, but there are still labors to be done, uh, whether it's the casserole or the visit uh, and to, to let those be predictable and taught mm. in a community so that we don't have to improvise them. Mm. Because when we improvise them, we think we're going to do it wrong, and so we don't do it. Uh, but to have the whole co community gathered in some kind of common labor around the occasion of death is itself part of the processing of yeah. the dead and the healing. Kind of a reminder that ceremony helps us know what to do when we don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What I'm hearing also, and I'd love to hear more from all three of you about this, because you, I know you were all heavily involved in that, in that the, uh, we're, we're, I feel like we're also talking about the rituals, the rituals involved with dying and death, um, and what, what the impact of minimizing that in this country has, has done to our culture, and I would love to hear more about this. I, I, I think we have tried to be and I have to say as a funeral director that too many times we were we found ourselves doing for people when our real job is to embolden them to do for themselves. So rather than um, um, getting everything done, for, I mean, uh, when someone calls in the middle of the night for you to come and help them with a death in the family that has occurred in the home or in a nursing facility or in a hospital or a hospice facility, if you show up, you are already 
if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, a hero. The same is true for the clergy who show up not during regular business hours, but when deaths occur outside, outside of that. But I think too often we have tried to um, take over the job. I think of this particularly in the case of cremation, and I'm glad you asked this question, because half of the deaths now in this country, very nearly, certainly in my town, end in cremation. And too often that procedure is so uh, devoid of community impact um, that I end up going alone to the crematory, even though I've asked, asked the family and invited them and encouraged them to send, to come with me or to send someone in their stead, but for someone to be able to say, I saw it, it was done right, everything was fine, or to send their clergy person. Um, because really, if, if we regard a good funeral as one that gets the dead where they need to go, and the living where they need to be, by, by the living getting the dead where they need to go, they, they get their portion of good medicine, then it's me going alone to the crematory with a corpse. That's the funeral, badly attended. And I think a difference we could make is if, and I must say, I learned this from Jake Andrews, Father Jake Andrews, an Episcopal priest, who would get into the hearse and say, where are we going today, this back in the... 1970s and 80s when uh, the community was turning from burial to cremation. He said, I don't care if you're burning or burying, I have to go. They are my saint. I see them to the end. After Jake kept going to the crematory, people postponed their teas and cakes and ices and fell into line behind the hearse and came with us to the fire, seeing in it the same brilliant gift uh, as open ground for the disposition of the dead. I think uh, our powerful rituals aren't just repeated actions. I mean, you can dance the hokey pokey ten times and it would be a ritual, but not, not very important. But they rest on great narratives so that these rituals tell stories. Um, when the couple marrying come into the place of marriage from different directions and then leave together, you've told a story of where they've come from and where they're going and how they are accompanying each other. And I think there's an incoherence to a lot of our funeral rituals or memorial service rituals today. We gather in a room and one thing happens after another, but there's no narrative understructure to it. And so when no story is being told, then it becomes less important for us to do it mm. uh, and less healing when we, when we do because we're not mediating uh, a narrative. As it relates to your question, I think uh, if we use, you know, I love the principle seek to understand. The one trend we would should acknowledge is, you know, we're seeing some deritualization around death in our culture. And I sometimes have people uh, who enjoy exploring with me uh, the interest I have in what's contributed to that. And I, and I think of, and I'd be interested in other people's perceptions, we live in the world's first death-free generation, meaning you'll meet people in their 40s who've never attended a ceremony, not had it transgenerationally passed down, so they come naked to the experience but don't understand the value of elements, if you will, of ceremony or the why in general. Um, we've lost death symbols rapidly in North American culture um, in the late 1960s, early 70s, where instead of wearing mourning clothes where we could identify each other, we now thought maybe it was somehow better to, to put us all together. But the point of morning clothes, of course, was to acknowledge there's someone with special needs and to hold up their love story. And you wouldn't go very far down the street and somebody would say, who died? So as we, as we rapidly lost death symbols, as we became a part of the world's first death-free generation, as we've lost as a culture, uh, I believe, in many ways, an understanding of the role of hurt, pain, and suffering, there are times when we not only hurt, but that we suffer. But if we think we have some kind of God-given right to go around it instead of through it, we start eliminating things that bring that into play, if you will, through those actions. And so then I think we have an obligation as gatekeepers, whether we're in hospice care, we're a clergy person, funeral director, grief counselor, to teach people about, well, why, when words are inadequate, do we use ceremony to help people know what to do when they don't know what to do? And while there's different frameworks for doing it, I often... I. I 
I passionately enjoy teaching people that if you go back and you look uh, in the beginning of time, some of the functions, and I know you, you two just wrote a book called The Good Funeral that we should have you speak to and encourage people to, to pick up because you do a beautiful job of, of, of knowing that people aren't going to go away and say, oh, I see what you did. You interface needs of mourning with elements of ceremony. They're going to say, now that was a good funeral. But how do they have a good funeral? And how do we know that people haven't already said goodbye because they've done anticipatory grief, which is a misnomer for some, that, well, they've already said their goodbyes. No, you're never really ready. That's intellectual preparation, right? So we still need bridges back, that rite of passage that Van Gennep said. We have ceremony to help us know what to do and to bridge us back into our community. So briefly, because you got me excited asking the question. Thank you. Reality, recall, support, expression, meaning, transcendence. When I think of a good funeral, I think of how can you use elements to help dose people with a new reality. Somebody I love has died. I'm going to have to create a whole new narrative like I've been lately. My mom and dad have both died now. I'm an adult orphan. Oh, when I had that ceremony, I wasn't just mourning for my mother. I went back and did catch-up mourning for my dad who died 10 years ago. Recall. You come together and... You infuse meaning through, in part, knowing how did this person touch your life. When somebody stood up and said, we all know that if anybody's in heaven right now, it's your mother, and here's why. What a sense of meaning through recalling the life and how she touched. We activate support. We invite people to come prior to any kind of formal ceremony, hopefully, through what we historically called the wake, where we, out of respect for the ultimate symbol of the body, stayed present until we laid you to final rest, right? And we came together in that context and supported those people who were primary mourners. Expression, music, symbols, action that you made reference to. Oh, now I'll go from knowing something in my head to my heart. Meaning, probably the, they're all critical. But how do I infuse meaning in that ceremony so when I go away, I want to search because I'm not going to find it quickly. You know, I always say those who do not search do not find. How in the context of the ceremony Do we say it's okay to say why him or her? Not tell him not to ask why. And then lastly, transcendence, which relates to that bridge underneath all those others to help you come back into your community in a changed social status where we wrap our loving arms around you. We We let you know we still want you to be a part of the community. Many people today are cutting the bridge off. I'm seeing people at my center who come in and say, what funeral? I thought it'd be easier, faster, and cheaper not to have one. And then they come for therapy for two, three years. So that's not the only influence on complicated mourning, which we're seeing in epidemic fashion. But I firmly believe that one influence on aspects of our mourning being very complicated in this culture is we've moved away from ceremony. And we have an experience, but we miss the meaning. The old T.S. Eliot quote, you can have an experience and you can miss the meaning. Thanks for asking about about ceremony. And we might want to have you to mention your book. I want to respond to what you're saying. I I think you're right about the loss of ceremony, although another way to describe it is we're replacing one kind of ritual with another kind. Uh, One kind of ritual has movement in it, Mm -hmm. and the other is simply stillness. Mm. Uh, The movement is the ancient metaphor. We are accompanying each other on the journeys of life and death. That starts way before hospice, but it moves through hospice to the march to the cemetery or the, or the, or the fire and then uh, keeps on going. But if we start plugging into the notion of accompanying different words like memorializing or celebrating, celebrating. Um, those are still images mm. in which we gather in a room and we do a cognitive thing mm. But we don't march, we don't walk with each other uh, along the way. And finally it dawns on us, I don't need to come here and do this. I can do this elsewhere. I can do it by myself. I can do it in the stillness of my own personality without hassling myself with others around me. And suddenly we lose the community moving together, our accompanying our dead. Uh, All all of that washes out in favor of a very uh, individualistic, inwardly directed, still moment. What do you make of the popularity, you two, of the, what I'd call, overuse of the concept of celebration or party that I've been doing some writing about that concerns me? Because I, I, like you, believe 
While well intended to say we celebrate the life, we never want to do that to the exclusion of remembering the words, blessed are those who mourn. And I think we're on the edge of that. Right. It's very confusing to kids who I work with a lot when grandpa dies and all of a sudden we're having a party or having a celebration because kids are our best teachers about mourning and they instinctively mourn. And so then they hear everybody talking about we're having the party and they go, I don't feel like having the party. Grandpa right. taught me to fish. I don't, I, I'm sad. Yeah. What, what yeah. do you make of this? How do you, Celebration or party, uh, I don't, I don't like. It's a sales bromide, and it's it's simply easier. Anyone who um, deals in the trinketry of celebrating life uh, has figured out that it's easier to sell the good laugh than the good cry. Mm -hmm. They're both good, but we're better we're better at the user friendlies than the user challenging, and um, we're better at happy than sad. Sure, and there's nothing. There's nothing so much of a, I mean, if you really want a downer in church or chapel or mosque or mortuary, bring the corpse in because it's hard to get around that That's right. the old of the or time. over it. Yeah. And the motion that you talk about so eloquently, Dr. Long, I, I have to thank you for that because you, have, you see this uh, in, it, in its active dynamics. There is a manifest to a funeral, and one of and the manifest to it is listen closely. We got to get rid of the dead guy, mm -hmm. and the reasons are fairly simple. We don't have to think about them. If we don't, they'll smell, mm -hmm. they'll embarrass themselves and disturb us. So since the beginning, since since the upright carnivores that became humans first figured out what to do with the dead, it was because if they didn't, it smelled bad. It disturbed us. So we began to move them along the way. And on that pilgrimage, on that, as you call it, the sacred journey for them, um, and sacred theater involved in doing it, and the sacred labor and the sacred text that goes with it, uh, on that way we started to wonder, um, is this all there is? Mm -hmm. Can this happen to me? Where have they gone? Are we all alone? What comes next? Yeah. And the formation of those, curio those concerns forms our theology. It informs our medicine. Uh, our emotional life is certainly driven up and down the, uh, the uh, emotive register by our religious impulses. So, um, like it or not, we're thrown in this together, but I think sometimes we should... Um, we should look carefully at how they came into being. And how they came into being was, first of all, we had to get rid of the dead guy yeah. in the cave or the, wherever they were. We had to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, and we're acting out a basic human necessity. When yeah. somebody dies among the living, they need to be transported mm -hmm. to the place of farewell and fairly quickly. There's a physical human necessity. But we've always done it as a sacred responsibility, too, that the dead are going somewhere. And it may be difficult to let them go. We may do it with tears and protests even. But we're acting out that they're, that they're going somewhere. If we quit acting that out and get into the still, silent place, then the dead must stay with us. And they literally become too much for us to bear. Yeah. And uh, so, therefore, we have to get rid of them and pretend like we're celebrating uh, the interesting paradox of, I just want to remember them the way they were when they were alive, when in fact that's not the function of seeing exactly. the ultimate symbol. That's it's to help you shift the narrative from presence to memory. I mean, that yeah, sounds kind of academic, but right. I'm saying hello to get to goodbye. I'm going backward before I go forward. Yeah. I'm allowing myself to be in the dark before I'm in the light. Above my desk at the Center for Loss, I read it every morning before i privileged to see a family. It says, darkness is the chair upon which light sits. And, and I observe that we've, we've culturally kind of flipped those. We try to, you're going to grow from this. I had a lady come up to me yesterday here at this convention and say, oh, it's a good thing your friend died when you were 14. You've, read, you've written many best-selling books on grief. And I, I know she was well-intended, but I'll take my friend. You can have the books. But you ever notice how we prescribe growth? You'll grow from this to go into hospice care. Now, gentlemen, I know one of their hopes was that we would spend some time talking about the collaboration between hospice and funeral homes, and that many of our listeners today out there are representing hospice and funeral homes. And so I, is it all right if I shift gears a little bit and ask Dr. Friedman, what are some of the ways that people in funeral service and folks in hospice care, all involved in end-of-life care, can collaboratively work together? You know, there's enough, enough death and grief to go around and the more we can partner with each other, 
and though we're all there to help families, the better. What, what are thoughts you have? Well, my first thought is we need to get together, uh, and that I think it's it's not that common within hospice and uh, for uh, there not to be. I mean, there's there's some collaboration in the sense of knowing of knowing um, you know who the funeral homes are in your community, the funeral directors, uh, what services are offered. Um, and things like that so that you can, you know, help educate families when they come in and they want, they want to know if they haven't made any plans and they don't have any choice, what's out there? Well, here's everything that's out there. But that's not the same thing as, as us being able to get together like we're doing today and actually learn where we're coming from, um, share our thoughts and experiences, um, so that we can actually learn from each other and work together to, um, help the people that are that are that are seeking this information the the person who's who's going to be dying uh, is ultimately going to die and and their uh, family and their and their caregivers which is usually family um, and loved ones uh, to be able to sit down and not just collaborate which is probably what we sort of do right now but to actually be able to share uh, to talk about experiences like like we're doing today to be able to do some give and take to understand better where we're coming from um, and where we all need to go to um, actually, to to enrich the experience for the people that we're we're, we're helping during this time is really important. And, and honestly, I've been involved with um, hospice care uh, for 18 plus years now. Probably doing more of that when I was just a, uh, when I was just say Jess, but when I was just doing family practice, um, and there was no formal hospice in my community. Uh, but in terms of actually um, spending time uh, with funeral directors. Um, going out and visiting. I've, do, I've done some of that here in the community. I don't know, if, uh, and I probably have been remiss in not doing enough, um, and I don't know that, that other, other, other colleagues of mine have done a lot of that or not, to be honest with you, but my feeling is that there hasn't been enough overall, and, uh, and yet there's so much to learn. Um, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot just sitting here listening to all of you talk because you're all so wise, um, and it really gets me thinking, and I think I would love to see more of that. Are there any challenges that we're aware of in the collaborations or the issues between funeral directors and, and, and people in hospice? If we wanted to acknowledge that at times um, part of that dialogue is to say, what, what is it that I would find helpful if you would do to assist me and vice versa? Is in that getting to know each other process? Is there? I think the borders sometimes blur, which is <laughs> the good news and the bad news. So that issues of agency and ownership and who's in charge of all this, and this cer certainly happens across and between and amongst all of us in our occupational and professional uh, um, activities. But I, I think we have to acknowledge, first of all, that for the most part, hospice people keep the same strange hours the clergy do, and that undertakers, if they're any good, also do. I used to say to people, uh, you can call your insurance company tonight, and you can call your um, uh, whoever else you want. Call the funeral home. Call the pastor. Chances are they'll answer. And the same is true of hospice. They probably don't have to be called. They're probably there. And I think, just speaking from my stand, standpoint, um, I don't know if you know the power you bring. The... Uh, the assurance that someone is helping us, that someone knows the drill, has been around this track before, knows what questions to ask, is ready to hear my questions when I'm ready to ask them, is, is just means I don't have to ask as many. It brings a, a calm and an order to it. The same is true religiously. I do not, I do not think the priests and pastors uh, and rabbis that I know have any inkling. Well, maybe they do. Of the, of the power it is when they open their um, sacramental arms to the bereaved. Um, uh, and particularly the huge amount and number of bereaved who aren't churched anymore. They're welcomed home in a sense. So. And, and, uh, and what you're doing now is a beautiful thing, and that is you're spotting the value of what another helping professional does in this complex process. I think I don't know that this happens between hospice and funeral homes. It sometimes happens between clergy and funeral homes. There's the kind of presumption of purity on one side mm -hmm. 
Um, we're the ones dealing with pure theology, the pure religion, but they're uh, mercantile and commercial yeah. and uh, profit-driven, uh, and so there's a danger zone when you cross the right. cross the line. And um, conversations like this take the poison out of that, I think, uh, of that assumption of, that purity resides in one place but not in another. We're a team here. I occasionally will have... Um let me first say this. I think that many hospices and funeral homes and, and faith communities collaborate beautifully together. But I think if we're openly acknowledging some challenges, we could give illustrations at both ends. I'll sometimes have a, um, a funeral director who will say to me, uh, uh, they felt that if the family was over-directed to either use a particular place for f- funeral or told maybe they didn't possibly even need a funeral. They've already said goodbye. That doesn't happen very often, but it happens occasionally. And I, we wouldn't want to overgeneralize that because most people in hospice care know that ceremony is critically important and that the role in caring for families doesn't end with the time of the death. So, so I, I would use that as an illustration at the one end. And then occasionally I have hospice people who will say things to me like last week I had a hospice <laughs> call me and say, Dr. Wolfelt, what, what can we do? There's a particular funeral home here in town that insists that even when we have a death during the middle of the night, two or three o'clock, that instead of coming and making, you know, what's called a removal and then setting a time potentially for that family to meet later, and again, I don't think we would overgeneralize this. You could help me with that as a funeral director. But they insist the family does that at two or three o'clock in the morning. This hospice last week was saying, that doesn't make sense to us. And they were kind of checking with me if I thought it made sense because the family was exhausted. They didn't really want to push to make the deadline for the obituary is what they were saying. They told the family. Mm-hmm. So what I've just done is give you examples to, to kind of openly acknowledge that sometimes part yeah, of the dialogue of needed is to yeah. say, let's let's talk about these things because yeah. we're all here to help the family. That's yeah. Let's help the family. Can you? Who could comment on those things? Well, I would say, first of all, it... It, a lot of that goes back to what I mentioned earlier, goals of care, which have to do with what the family needs are, really. Um, and so that um, I can speak that within, within my hospice experience, uh, we, we respect that. Um, respect what? We um, respect the fact that if the, pay, if the family, the fact that we respect, we respect the idea of allowing the family and loved ones to spend as much time as they want to with their deceased loved one. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's paramount. No one should say... Time's up, got to go. Um, that's not how it should work, um, and I think we probably would all agree with that. Um, but I think that um, respecting respecting the 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 totality of it too. For example, I will give an example. Uh, we have an inpatient unit where people come to when they need to, and and people do die there. Um, and so families come in and they can actually stay there. Um, it's not that large a facility, just to let you know. It, it has uh, 50, 15 beds for 15 people. Um, and uh, we've had people who died there and had too many to count people show up to, the, to, to Christopher House, and no one tells them they need to go or need to leave. We, we ask the people respectful of the fact that there are other people there, but that's as far as it goes uh, because it's really important not to interfere with what the family is going through at that time um, and to be able to allow them to experience what they're going through and not move it out or move it away or separate them from that uh, by telling them that, you know, your loved one's deceased, uh, we need to have someone come pick up the body, um, and, and then, and then t- please take this elsewhere or something like that. That's not what it's about. It's all about meeting what their needs are uh, to the best of our abilities. I, I hope that answers at least well, part of I it. Maybe I misspoke a little bit. Yeah. I, I wanted some help with the example given to me by my friends at this oh. hospice who were concerned that, and maybe you can speak to this, because I don't think that the most funeral homes would necessarily do this as a standard of care. But their concern, if we're using that illustration, was the funeral home showed up at 3 o'clock in the morning and insisted the family mm. do the arrangement conference then. That's not commonplace, well, I can't is it? imagine it's unless there was some eagerness to find out whether they should do uh, body preparation or something like that. But I, see. I think it's important that everybody, uh, regardless of their... Uh, their, how they're going to interact with families. At this. And they have to sort of examine their own consciences. To, because, because if they don't, I guarantee you families will. Uh, they occupy the most sold-to generation in the history of the planet. They, they, they get pitched for, you know, 
bowel obstructions and lapsed erections and restless leg syndrome from you can't watch the television from four in the afternoon till ten at night without considering all the uh, the maladies to which you may have have fallen and this pill will fix it so they know a sales pitch when they hear it and so if somebody is trying to tell them that they have to meet at a certain time and they discern anything like a a selfish interest, and they'll know it in a minute. They'll know it whether it's their pastor, their undertaker, their hospice worker, their shrink. I'm sorry, their counselor. They <laughs> they, a, they will hear. It. They know it from their bartender. They, sure. They so it's better if we just examine our own consciences and know our own hearts and our own motives. I have to tell you though how good hospice can be, uh, because my I, I have to say, and I appreciate that there are border squabbles from time to time. Well, I guess really what are. I'm saying is just create an open dialogue so that right. those don't become distancers. Yeah. Just say, hey, we've got an issue. Let's come together and I'll learn about right. you. You learn about me. What would we like to see different right. as opposed to just distancing yourself and, and then devaluing that other caregiver? Collaborate. In that I've sense. been read so, the riot act by pastors and priests, and they have every right in their church and in their parish to say exactly what's going to happen. Much as I've read the riot act, on occasion to pastors who want to tell me how it's going to happen or how my employees are going to interact with the families. It's none of their business. So, I, I mean, but pretty soon we work that out. I mean, it's happened like once in 45 years that I thought there was really some hardship in it. I, th I think there are uh, practices that um, we have to work out uh, together. I also think that there are truths about this that from our angles of vision we have a better perspective on. I think hospice has resurfaced the great truth of attending to the body of the deceased, not rushing people out, mm -hmm. uh, letting them spend uh, time with that. So if there are others of us who are rushing things along, the testimony of hospice keeps us all whole. I've learned about the importance of accompanying the body all the way to the end. So when a cemetery wants us to drop the casket off, at a faux chapel and then leave while the power equipment comes in and takes them to the real grave, I have a testimony that that is not uh, a good embodiment of that, mm -hmm. uh, of that truth. So we all see different things about what good care is. But I think we have a, we have a burden on us, an obligation to uh, put the testimony in uh, and teach each other about good to practices. To at times supportively uh, kind of confront each other, but in an appropriate way, right? To yeah. say we've got this going on. I think also that the bottom line in, in, this, in this circumstance is that uh, patient and or, or families, the, the person who's dying and or the family members, they'll make, the funeral, they'll make their funeral arrangements when they're ready. Yes. And it's not the same for everyone. And so that's, that's where we come from. Um, the person who probably makes the, has the most contact for that aspect of, of working with a family uh, would, would be our social worker. Um, and it's not typically what you would see in hospice, just in terms of periodically touching back with the family, you know, carefully, you know, asking where they're at and if they haven't made, you know, funeral arrangements um, to discuss if they've given thought to it. But, but each, it has to be done, it has to be personalized for each family. Each family has its own culture in terms of how you're going to approach that. Uh, just to know where they're at and know what's, what's, what, um, what role we can help with or will be part of at that time when their loved one does die, all the way up to the point where um, there, are, there are families who don't and, and people who are dying who don't make those decisions really until the person has died. I know you see that also. So there's a whole spectrum. And although we are there to help and to educate, um, I don't I don't. Feel that we should never be te we should never be telling anyone that you need to decide by a yeah. certain time, um, and um, or this is what's going to happen or something like that. Um, it's it's all just working with the family to, to um, help them arrive at the decision when they're ready to do so. I'm really glad you brought that up because I I think the whole notion that somehow uh, planning ahead will somehow get us out of some of the mm -hmm. trouble that a death in the family puts us into. Um, it is, uh, should be suspect. The best plan, the best policy, um, all the discussion about it does not uh, undo the sting of death. And, um, and, and it's also true that for uh, uh, centuries, people did this without planning ahead. They counted on the church 
or the community or the family or their ethnic background or uh, to devise the wheel that worked the space so that if you were, you know, uh, if you had roots in southern Italy uh, uh, or uh, and, and a death occurred in your family, you didn't have to wonder what was going to happen. You knew where you'd be for the next three or four days. You knew what you'd wear, what you'd eat, what you'd say, and to whom, and what would be said to you. And um, and you knew that after that you'd have to get back to work and uh, uh, get over it and get on with it. And you would and you would fall back sometimes, and you would have to count on the kindness of friends and strangers and your faith community to hold you up again. So I, I think in, in some ways we may have over-specialized this. I always think the metaphor for this is uh, something I saw at a convention one time, this beautiful mahogany uh, contraption with wheels and gears on it that went over a cremation grave. And I asked the fellow, what was that? And he said, well, that's a, an urn um, lowering device. I said, be still my heart. He said, well, what do you use for lowering urns into the grave? And I said, grandchildren. <laughs> we ask them to wear blue jeans when they do it. And I think it might be the same way with yeah. our, our um, uh, impulses. I can speak to the mortuary impulses. I'm trying to learn rather than do for, to do with. And, uh, and I think it, it might be... Sound counsel, you know. And I think that applies. I, I I think that applies across the board because the, the people that I work with and that I come into contact with, you know, hospice providers, uh, no matter what aspect of hospice they're providing for, uh, really that's something we face every day, just in terms of um, what we would what we think we would like to see uh, happen or done versus what uh, what the person who's all about. And their family really would like to see happen, and and so I think every day when we wake up, we have to remember, um, you know, who we're serving. Why do you do what you do, Doctor Friedman? Why why did you evolve out of family medicine to palliative care? Ah. Boy, um, I guess the easy answer is I found it was my passion, but that doesn't answer anything at all, really. <laughs> uh, I I really enjoy spending time with people. I enjoy spending time with families. And honestly, when I made the decision to go into family medicine, I thought that would, from a professional aspect, you know, satisfy that need at the same time while being employed. Um, and as it turned out, it, it only did up to a point. And I found that by being able, by making house calls initially, uh, by being able to go into people's homes and spend time with them, being welcomed in, um, and um, learning about the people within their family culture, I got to know people so much better, and I got to understand so much better uh, what, their, what their desires were, what their needs were, how I could potentially help them, or, or who I could potentially help find to help them if they needed help or requested it. Um, and for me, it was just so much more satisfying, um, and I, I found, it just, I just found in doing that, that from pr- probably an emotional and a spiritual perspective that helping people during um, someone's uh, end of life uh, was just, for me, so much more profound. It meant so much more for me. It was selfishly much more fulfilling uh, for me to be able to do that. Um, it's what, I forget which one of you mentioned it, but I always, always kind of refer to myself as being kind of like a, a guide. I, I, yeah, I've almost felt like writing into one of those uh, the, the men the, those men's magazines, you know, that talk about trekking the Himalayas and trek guides and stuff like that, saying because they always talk about their ultimate treks and the ultimate trek guides. And I would like to write in sometime and say, well, for me, the ultimate trek guide is being able to help guide someone to help someone uh, and their loved ones uh, move through um, dying and death, and then what comes after. Not in terms for that person, but for the family. Um, and, and hospice has afforded me that. Um, so it's been, for me, very fulfilling, and, and I really couldn't see myself doing anything else, um, uh, not just at this point in time in my life. I, I kind of wish I had gotten involved sooner, um, and I have no regrets. You know, I love that saying. It says, I don't, I don't care about what you do until I know why you do it, and that's why I posed. And I, I was going to ask if I could, each of you, the same thing. Why, 
why ministry? Why helping people with end of life and then creating meaningful ceremonies in the context of what you do, which is a, a lovely ministry? Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a theologian and a teacher, and um, I got interested in this area because I was teaching a course that didn't have a good book to put on the syllabus about funerals. Oh, the God. wisdom uh, that was in the literature that was there seemed to be either dated or pinched and slanted in, a, in an unhelpful direction. So I started doing the research myself to write such a book oh, and ended up getting converted by my own research, by my own data, into seeing things in a different uh, way and seeing much more power. How are you converted? What's an example of your conversion? Yeah. What, what I thought I was going to write at first was a book in which uh, the purpose of the funeral was strictly grief management for the living. Okay. So that the the deceased would be dispensable. Uh, you know, the death was the occasion to gather everybody to do grief therapy. Okay. Uh, but when you look historically, that's uh, that's very small. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the the drama of the funeral in all human cultures is our carrying the one who has died, whom we have been traveling with in life, carrying them to the place of, of farewell. And whatever meaning is constructed about that. We tell that story as we go. It's you. Canterbury Tales. We tell stories as we're headed you to the great feast. Tell the feast. tale. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So uh, we had downsized funerals. I was became persuaded uh, of this, and so I wrote uh, to appeal. And to by downsized, you mean we, yeah, we it have had an become, experience it had in this It had become grief, grief management. Yeah. The deceased is not traveling. Only the mourner is traveling. And the deceased is not traveling across time and space. The mourner's traveling intrapsychically, and that's all this is about. Um, so they became the star of the drama rather than the child of God moving yes. to, to be with God. Um, I want to pick up on something that you said, Bob, about being a guide. I, I, found, I find that a helpful image because I think we sometimes get caught between two images. We don't want to be the expert with technique and telling people what they ought to do. So we sometimes replace that with, I have nothing to bring. What do you want to do? I want to serve your wishes and your needs, which is fine, except people often don't know in this uncharted territory what, what is wise to do, what is good to do. So the guide who is not the expert, but not the know-nothing, um, takes the hand of the person who is journeying through this to say, you know, you could go down that road, but there's a cul-de-sac down there. <laughs> we've, been, we've been down that road before, and here's what you will find. It's not satisfying. Let me suggest this one. This is the place of great vista, if you'll go out uh, on, on this way. You don't force them to do it, but you have been there before. You do have that wisdom uh, to offer. So you have that. some responsibility. Yeah to help people make potential transformations, you know, decisions that are good for them, that if yeah. you are a gatekeeper of a ceremony, for example, and you yeah. understand how to infuse meaning, you don't just say, well, do whatever you want. You try to convey what they might want to at least consider. Is that That's right. And when my, my mother died in hospice several years ago, and we were prepared for a lot of uh, the things that were called uh, that we were called on to do to accompany her, to sing with her, to pray with her, to, to be with her. We had to make a decision at one point about whether to take the feeding tube out. And um, we'd never done that before for anybody in our family. And it was a theological issue. It was an ethical issue. It was a physical care issue for her. And fortunately, we were in a hospice that had people who could help us think it through. We, we didn't want them to make the decision. We wanted to make the decision, but we didn't want to make it in the dark. Yeah, I, I love the, the, the semantic of, I don't treat people like companion, calm for with, pan for bread, with bread, a friend, and equal. And I love what you're saying in that it's not just, we have an obligation. We have an obligation as a caregiver who's dedicated our lives to this realm of caregiving to not come on, across projecting es expertise and superior knowledge, but to take that body of knowledge and provide information and education and, and honor choices that people make. And I... I just really appreciate what you've said. I don't treat people, but I do companion them. And, and that comes with I'm responsibility. I'm thinking about more, more than us. I'm thinking about those people in that Irish uh, village that uh, Tom goes to. They have 
generations of wisdom built into their life together that they don't even have to reflect on too much, but they, they guide you through. They do it. They guide you but through. But as it. we move from the front porch to the back porch, we don't do it as yeah, much. Yeah. And can I ask you, why, do you, why funeral service? How'd you get going in that? Um, it made me feel like a hero early on for just showing up. <laughs> just showing up and doing my part. You know, I could do that. But I, I always had, and thanks for the question, but I've always been deeply interested in language, which seems to me uh, one of God's great gifts, and um, oh, yes. that, um, uh, and I, and it seems to me that uh, we are trying to act out the things that are unspeakable, the religious uh, sensibilities that bring us to uh, awe and wonder and worship and devotion, um, proceed from a sense that. Um, the lexicon, the language itself, actually gives us uh, admission. It lets us into some of this mystery so that gravid and gravitas and grave and gravity occur on the same page of the, so that pregnancy and the pit we put our dead in have the same root word, just as human and humus and humane and humanity. We are people of the earth. We use it to rise our monuments out of and our architectures and cities and our institutions and churches and our tombs and uh, uh, carns and graves, etc. But we, but we also uh, are, uh, you know, the earth is where we roll our grief into. And, uh, and I think for all of us, and I, and I find this most um, authentic in hospice volunteers, who do not bring a particular pedigree educationally or experientially. Most of them, I find, got into their work because uh, someone took care of their mother or father uh, or their sister or brother and moved by that decency, that uh, grace. They said, I could do that because they know that all you have to ante up is your humanity. Ante up your your fellow pilgrimage. We're trying to find our way home too, but we can help you with yours at this particular time. And I think if, if, because really I think that's what people want from us. They, they assume we have some expertise because, you know, in one way or another we all charge a pretty penny. Every one of us. You can do the math on this. But what they really want is the sense that we, we know what we're talking about. And furthermore, we know we are the ones who knew them all along because we've studied what it is to be alive and sad and joyous and alone and a part of a community because we've watched it in our own work. You can't work the door at a funeral home all day without finding how heroic your neighbors can be. You know, you know, one you thing know. you make me reflect on, many people brought to hospice care, whether that's volunteers or professional caregivers, uh, whatever their role might be, be they a social worker or chaplain, we're just, we're just blessed in, in, in hospice care to use holistic models of caregiving. Or whether you're in the ministry or you're in funeral service, many people come to caregiving lives because they've come to know some element of wound. And I just want a little caveat out there that there's a little message out there that sometimes people, because they've known loss, lose objectivity to be able to be present. And I couldn't disagree with that more. Your greatest gifts come from your wounds. So if those of you out there listening have come to hospice care or gone into the ministry or become a funeral director because you knew loss in your life, you know, do your work. But don't let anybody give you the message that you can't bring objectivity to holding up and giving honor to people's love stories. You know, I, I do this because at age 14, my best friend Phil died of leukemia. I was going to be an architect. I found a calling. I love what I do. I hope you can feel it, my passion. But there's a current message out there that says if you do something out of this passion, you can't create sacred space and hold up somebody's need to honor their love story backward. And I think I do a pretty darn good job of it. And I work every day with people in hospices and funeral homes and faith communities and people not in faith communities that also know that we've got to go backward to go forward. Hello 
to get to goodbye. And at times in all of our lives, we lose our divine spark, that which gives our lives meaning and purpose. And we need fellow travelers. And if I find a fellow traveler who has some common bond, don't let anybody out there tell you, well, you're just trying to heal yourself by helping others. Don't do that. Do your work. No, we never arrive. We're never done. There's times to maybe even step back and take a look at my own need to continue to mourn. But don't project on me that I can't help someone because I've known loss. And remember, what you folks do in hospice, it's sacred. Be so proud yet humble of what you do. Clergy, funeral directors, I love what I do as a grief care provider. Some people project that we're some kind of new industry. I'm not an industry. I had a death of a friend when I was 14. My two grandmothers died when I was 15. One good grandma, one not so good grandma. And at 16, I wrote a mission statement to have a center. And now every day of my life, I get to have people come to a place of sanctuary and hold up their love stories, where they say to me, like the lady did recently, I lived right here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is a woman who just stood up the other day in a seminar, and she goes, You said, Dr. Wolfelt, you like to honor love stories. Well, I'm going to tell you how I met. I'm 88 years old. I'm here at your public evening seminar tonight. Because when I was 15, I was at a party here in Fort Wayne. And there were some things going on that shouldn't have been. And the police showed up. And this much older man of 17, he grabbed me. And he hid me in the closet with him. I married him. And as she told it, she was crying and she was smiling in combination. Paradoxical emotions. The essence of what the work of mourning is often wrapped in. So thanks for letting me share that story. Because 80% of my time is honoring people's love stories. Much of what we do in hospice... Honoring love stories, following that rite of passage with people in a sacred time in their life, helping people with a meaningful funeral, giving a message infused with meaning. What we do is such a privilege, and I, I, I just can't tell you how glad I am that we're having these kind of dialogues to continue to get the word out about how important it is. I agree. I think it's really important also, um, this is so beautiful to hear all, uh, all, all of your wisdom. I really, I really appreciate you. And, 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 you know, we just met today, um, and I'm just totally amazed. Uh, I, I think that, um, in, in end of life care, which is what I'm involved in, uh, I, I feel that we, you know, we live in a society where there's a fair amount of guilt and blame. Um, and I think that people have a tendency to feel that way. Um, sometimes when things get emotional as an end of life, um, these things can become accentuated. It's, I think it's really important to, and, and it's, it's what I try to help people with in terms of, of guiding and, and letting people know, understand that, um, in end of life care, there, there are, there are really no right or wrongs. It's really what's best for you. And that I feel that it, it behooves you, therefore, to be, if you're willing to be, to be, to, to, to be educated and understand as much as you can about whatever situation you're dealing with so that you can make the best decision for you. Uh, but that it's, that, but it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of what works best for you. Um, and, and I firmly believe in that. Gentlemen, if I may, uh, before time seems to be ticking away pretty, uh, pretty quickly and before, uh, it gets away from us totally, I'd like to circle back uh, for a couple of things, and, and maybe that will lead us up to our conclusion. I just wanted to read um, a couple of uh, findings that um, the National Funeral Directors Association found in our 2013 Consumer Awareness and Preference Study, and it really reflects a lot of what's been said here earlier. Uh, one of the things that uh, was reported was the importance of having the body present at the funeral decreased 4.6% in 2013 versus 2012, and that brings it down to a total of 53% of survey respondents felt that having the body present for a funeral was either very important or somewhat important. Also, in 2013, significantly fewer respondents were aware that you can view an unembalmed body as part of a cremation service. Also, uh, half of the respondents said they would encourage their loved ones to plan a memorial cer uh, ceremony to recognize their passage, while 19% said they would discourage it. The top reason for discouraging a memorial ceremony were simply they didn't want one. They didn't want one. It isn't necessary. It's too expensive. It's too emotional for my su survivors. And despite some respondents stating that they did, they did not want a memorial cer uh, ceremony. Many still mentioned that they wanted some sort of service, something short and simple. They wanted a celebration and a party. 
Uh, we talked a lot about this. Uh, these numbers, you know, ideally are going in the wrong direction. It seems like when it comes to end-of-life end of care, uh, people are getting what they want rather than what they need. Uh, we've talked about border squabbles between uh, various uh, ideologies up here or various uh, professions. And basically, I want to circle back to the topic here, and that is the uh, relationship between hospice and funeral service moving forward. And we talked a lot about it, but I wanted to see and head towards the end with, with how we can strengthen these connections. What can we do to, because I did some research over the past couple of days while being in attendance here, some funeral directors are almost very wary of establishing relationships with hospice because they fear it's, it'll be perceived improperly as it's almost like ambulance chasing or something like that. Just wanted to see what your thoughts are on trying to establish these relationships and strengthen them at the same time educating the public more about the value of what you do. And anybody who well, wants Ed, to... There's a lot there. Do you want to start with uh, 47% then that don't perceive a body being present at a ceremony? Uh, I mean, where do we want to go there? There's a lot that you brought up. Yeah, I, I have to say that... Uh, well, just speaking from my own experience, I've, I've, I've had... A, my friend Dennis died in uh, Ireland last Christmas Eve, and by St. Stephen's Day, I had a ticket to fly over to attend his funeral. Another dear friend died this summer, and they had a, a memorial event, although this friend was um, immediately cremated and um, uh, his ashes entombed in, a, I believe, a church columbarium. I was uh, three hours away by car from that service. And I reflected on the morning of that service. Uh, I was up in northern Michigan. I fully intended on going uh, to that. But I woke up. It was a Sunday morning, and it was quite beautiful in Michigan. I looked out at the lake, and I said, well, my friend's not going to be there. Why need, do I have to go? There's nothing for me to do there. There was nothing to do for my friend Dennis in Ireland either except... Uh, be there and witness and uphold my part of the sort of uh, human bargain. So, um, and we see these, uh, sell, we see an awful lot of sort of funeral karaoke now where because people do not have a faith tradition or they're, they're, they, they don't feel emboldened to make faith claims about what's going to happen, they have replaced uh, eschatology with biography and uh, it looks a little bit like the prom dress that never fit you properly or the tuxedo that you rented. It's sort of the right style but not the right fit so that people are remembered for being golfers or gardeners or bowlers or bikers. Um, the one that made the rounds in August was a picture of people blowing bubbles over the coffin of a woman who was said to have liked Lawrence Welk music. Um, I can tell you that if I had a gotten on a plane and flown to New York and then flown to Shannon and then driven up to Dublin and somebody and added me uh, some bubbles to blow over Dennis, I'd have punched him. So I understand that people have, have probably um, gotten a little tired of the funeral karaoke that we have passed off as um, a good funeral. And if we can do anything by emboldening people to care for their own dying and by, by assuring people that what they're going through is part of the human business of grieving and by emboldening them to make claims about what they hope for or believe in or trust in or get glimpses and inklings of from time to time. If we can actually coordinate that kind of boldness the body will not be an accessory incidental to what's going on. The body will be the reason we're all here today because that's what happened. It's not a symbol. It's not a metaphor. Right. It's the flesh and blood fact of the matter, and when we confront it, it has heft and heartbreak, and to the extent that we can uplift it, and uplift each other in moving it from here to there, we will have done our jobs. 
And, you know, when you say the numbers are going in the wrong direction, it's a poll. It's a poll. Be bold, <laughs> I say. You know, I think we, um, the business about the body being not preferred to be present is quite complicated. And, uh, but one of the reasons I think that we're watching the numbers drop is that we have lied to people about the, what it means to have a body present. We've yeah. said things like, you know, Jessica Mitford made fun of, uh, it'll be a beautiful memory yeah, picture. Yeah. Or it, you look at the body, it creates automatic closure. Uh, or, you know, or creates some kind of mood of peace if we do this. Tom Lynch is right. We don't have the body present in order to effect some kind of metaphor or symbolic impression. We have the body there because the person is dead. And we have a responsibility to take this body to a place of farewell. So every every dead body gets taken somewhere, Mm -hmm. which means that the question is not really, are we going to have a body at the funeral? That is the funeral. Are we going to be present at the funeral (laughs) when the body is taken? Yeah. Thank you. Well said. Mm-hmm. Well, if you could just uh, go to the second part of my uh, my question there about going back to uh, to where we were, going from one set of arms to another, it seems that there have been some um, some barriers put up between, and just wondering how we can make the uh, connections between not so much a a straight line a. a a line of demarcation where one ends and one begins, but more of the overlapping circles. Now, how can we do that to uh, effectively bring about these relation, the strength in these relationships between the four areas that you represent? I think Bob's right on about if we each know our uh, what we see as our own sort of obligations to the family, uh, then we get more clear on whose day it is to watch it. So. I guess I've just not experienced, in rare occasions, and it's usually somebody who's just new at it, you know. But um, I think, uh, I know that NFDA does an awful lot of shared programming with the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organizations. I know that within our community there's a constant ongoing conversation among the young men and women who arrange our, you know, arrange funerals at our firm and the young men and women who are hospice administrators, and they they sort of cross-pollinate in terms of information and programming and stuff like that, and it works, it inures eventually to the benefit of all the families we we serve. So uh, it, it seems to work, and I, uh, more of this, the better, obviously. Yeah, thank you, I agree. It's just yeah. getting to know each other, really, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and understanding where we're coming from and how we all can work together to help. Yeah. And in working together, not projecting, this is what you need to know about me, but mm-hmm. in any getting to know you situation, mm-hmm. you, you start out by giving honor to the other. Help mm-hmm. me understand what your mission and what you do at hospice. How can I, as also an end-of-life care provider, work collaboratively with you to, to support you? And, and then if you invite me to teach you what I, as a, a grief companion, do to help people, I can, I can teach you that. But first seek to understand and then come together and... And don't compete. Collaborate. I, I always, you know, as I said earlier, there's a, you know, there's a lots of death. It's hundred percent. I think I heard you say earlier today. You know, it happens yeah, to I all of us. On that. Yeah. Lot you checked yeah. on that statistic. Yeah. So there's a lot to go around. Think of creating hospitality with each other in your communities. I know a number of hospices where people attend each other's meetings occasionally, and they listen in, and then they are able to contribute and give ideas and better understand each other. It's it's really truly, I think about. Knowing we're all in this together and we're collaborating, and what can we do to support each other in that in that sense? So, Tom Long has this wonderful uh, chapter in our new book, uh, in which he calls on the clergy and funeral directors and hospice workers and all of the caring community to to um, to undertake this. And he goes back to the original meaning of the word undertaker, which is someone who pledges to get the job to show up and do their part. But this pledge that you can entrust to somebody. And in that sense, we all are part of this one. We're all undertakers. All undertakers. And, um, uh, yeah, and the undertaking is as old as 
yeah. the species. So we will help you do what the human thing is to yeah. do. We, we're going to take part with you in doing this human thing. Yeah. And that goes back. I, you know, people always say to me, what's new in grief care? And I, and I always say, it's not so much what's new. It's what we once did that we're on the edges of losing if we don't go back and look mm-hmm. at why have we done this since the beginning of right. time. Yeah. So, so don't always look for the next technique to get somebody to let go. Yeah. Please don't do that, as a matter of fact. That's the last thing we knew. Uh, you know, the other thing I want to mention is, you know, grief... Loss, death, it's inherently spiritual, and, and it's sacred, and, and we need to honor that holistic model, and that's the beauty of hospice. We, we care physically, emotionally, cognitively, socially, spiritually. It's not one or the other, it's all of them combined, the holistic model of care, inherent to grief. We're affected in all, all those areas, and we need caregivers who bring sensitivity to all those. Yeah. And, and I think that... Um in terms of getting to know each other and working together, it's crazy to think that that any one of us coming from where we're coming from would undertake to do all of it ourselves. Sure. That doesn't make any sense. That's that's no, just crazy. And 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 the 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 fact is that we need each other, and we need to be able to work together uh, to do the best that we can to help the people that we're taking care of. Uh, it's not a question of one person really is dominant or one profession right. is dominant or one uh, business is dominant or anything like that and should be calling the shots or leading the way. It's a collaborative effort, um, and and it's it comes out of respect and understanding. If you think about that, you make me think of the, the definition of mourning, the shared social response to loss, grief gone public. We can't do it on our own. It's bigger than us. We have to stand under and to surrender to something that's much more powerful than we are. And we shouldn't do it alone, nor could we. I've had the good fortune of being able to recommend uh, hospice to people who are sort of at that, at that point in their, uh, their family's history where they need somebody to give them the good guidance that you talk about. But I sometimes get, I imagine you guys get this too, because we all have a hand in this, and we all have a sense of what the other one is doing. Sometimes, particularly among the unchurched in my community, they'll say, Tom, um, you know, after we've gotten the vital statistics and I've, you know, drafted an obit and sold them a set of boxes, etc., etc., they'll say, you know, maybe you could just do the service for us. You're really good. And, and I, of course, I'm, I charge more than any minister in town, and I tell them <laughs> they'd be better off just... Let me call one of the pastors. Do they have anything in their background? And there are, I have to tell you, even though they keep saying how the, the largest growing denomination is the unchurched, not one of them comes without a tradition that comes freighted with its own sacred language and text. And I cannot tell you how powerful it is when they hear for the first time in maybe a generation the 23rd Psalm. Um, or in Paradisum, or some dose of Latin at the entrance to the church, or one of Charles Wesley's great hymns. Is that his name, Charles? It was, yeah. They can't be best at the Methodist for hymns. But uh, um, it, it, it harkens back to something deep and primal in them um, that is uh, that heals. It does heal, I have to say. It's a, it's a human thing at these great pivot moments in life to need a priest even if it's yeah. even if it's the next door neighbor who's yeah. who's willing to say the right word or speak yeah. the right truth or touch the right right memory it doesn't have to be the person in robes but somebody has to stand in the breach yes. and say the word that's essential it the really midwife. is yeah yeah midwife yeah. the midwife the midwife yeah. you were saying you earlier doctor, about you need a midwife yeah. yeah you were saying earlier about the components of this and to me it comes i mean it is the corpse the mourners someone to stand in between them and say something like behold i show you a mystery right. and then get rid of the corpse yeah. get rid of the dead guy yeah. help me yeah. know what Your to job do is yeah. and i don't know what to do that's help right. me know what to do behold i show you a yeah. mystery yeah. right there yeah, yeah. so well, here at the National Funeral Directors Association Convention, one of the uh, things talked about a lot is a program called the Have the Talk of a Lifetime by the Funeral Memorial Information Council, of which NFDA is part of. And that program is basically encouraging families to have the talk about what's important to them with their families. That way, 
it's done, the communication is there before it gets too late and there's nothing left but regret. And I'm happy to have been part of this panel right here where we're starting the conversation among these four groups to uh, hopefully have the conversation to help strengthen the end of life care. And what I'd like to do to wrap things up, gentlemen, if you'd like to do is just have the, any closing remarks and in that if there are, if you can just summarize some takeaway points that you would like to offer to the audience out of this program. And I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Wolfelt and we'll go hmm. reverse from the way we started. All right. You know, some wise person said, uh, death may not be the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss in life may be what dies inside you while we live. I'm very concerned right now that, that we are what Miriam Greenspan has referred to as an emotion phobic, or I in my writings call a mourning avoidant culture, where we're trying to go around death at times still. That while we've come a long way and we have hossips and we have caregivers, I think I, I continue to meet too many people who don't understand the significance and the role of moving toward, you know, simply yet profoundly. The only way to the other side is through. But I think that European author is right right now. The first thing you need to know about North Americans is they think death is optional and that while we're talking about this, we haven't arrived. People still think we should use techniques to get people to let go, to have closure. No, mourning doesn't end. Our obligation, our care continues way beyond hospice, way beyond the funeral to support people as they'll continue to mourn. And again, just a privilege to be with you, to create a dialogue about the importance of coming together and collaborating, not competing. Thank you. It's an honor. I, I, I'm like Alan. I'm grateful for the camaraderie and the collegiality. I, I think I'll give you a poem because I'd lose my place in the standing army of internationally unknown poets if I didn't. <laughs> Years ago, I started writing sonnets on my birthday uh, as, as a way to mark the advancing years. And one year, a few years back now, I wrote one, and when I counted up the lines instead of the 14 that are required of a sonnet, it had 15 lines in it, which gave me a really cute title called uh, Refusing at 52 to Write Sonnets. And it's based on the... <laughs> It's based on the certainty that the older we get, the less we count. It came to him that he could nearly count how many Octobers he had left to him in increments of 10 or, say, 11, thus 63, 74, 85. He couldn't see himself at 96. Humanity's advances notwithstanding in health care, self-help, or New Age regimens, what with his habits and family history. The end, he thought, is nearer than you think. The future thus confined to its contingencies. The present moment opens like a gift. The balding month, the gray week, the blue morning, the hours routine, the minutes passing glance, all seem like godsends now. And what to make of this? At the end, the word that comes to us is thanks. Thanks. Well, what I've learned today is not to sit next to the Irish poet. Uh, and <laughs> Be careful with the Presbyterian minister, too, boys. Uh, you know, there's a, a great... Uh, thing at stake in doing what we're talking about well, uh, not simply because we will immediately serve certain people who are needing care, but we're forming now a kind of public liturgy about life in doing hospice well, in doing funeral service well, in doing funerals well, because the people who watch these things and observe them from the edges are being drawn into something that is deeper and greater than they know how to form. And so it's a gift to the whole culture uh, to do this well, I think. Well, I normally talk a lot, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, um, I'm not quite speechless here. Um, but I'm going to just say something simple. We're all, all four of us are here today, I believe, because we care. And for me, that's what life is all about. Um, and I, I would like to think that for everyone, that's what life, life is all about, caring. About one thing, someone, some things, but it's all about caring. It's the emotions. 
and the spirituality that makes life worthwhile. And I just appreciate being able to sit down with the three of you, and thank you, Ed, um, f- and be able to, to be able to share and to share our, our caring experiences and our and and to know that there there are people like you and and others out there who also feel the same way and want to care. Uh, to me, that's what makes life worthwhile. Thank you, Bob. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And what I want to say in closing is to our panelists, thank you again for your wisdom, for sharing your insight and expertise, and even sharing your poetry. It was an honor to share this stage with you, and thank you all very much for watching. This has been a very insightful presentation. And I hope you got out of it as much as I got out of it. Thank you all again.